Today I'm going to be going over ways to save space on your NAS or drive. I'm going to be going over methods that you can use to delete files, remove duplicates, and compress files to save space. I'm going to be going over a lot of cool software utilities, and I'm going to try to link all of them that I show in this video below if you want to try using these. Let's first take a look at finding files you might want to delete. So if you have a file share with hundreds of thousands of files, you can't look through everything to see what you might want to remove. So there's some utilities that can help you find stuff that you want to get rid of. So on my screen is Windowstat, which is a great little visual utility to look at all the drives on a system, and it makes it really easy to find where is my big files, what types of files I have on my share, and lots of other information. If you're on a terminal on Linux, there's a similar utility called ncdu, where you can go through it like this and see all of it visually, but in the command prompt. Looking through my file share, I see some .ds store files. These are left if Macs go through your system because it contains metadata for the files. But if you're not always using Macs, it's easy to get rid of them and macOS can always recreate it if it needs that data. I like to use the find utility in Linux to remove these files. So I can use find dot, so start at the current directory, dash name dot ds store, the name of the file I want to remove, and then I can either have it list the files or I can just use dash delete to delete all the files in that folder. And I can also use this find utility to do other things. So for example, I could have it saying dash name temp, or in this example, iname, because I want it to be case insensitive. So then this shows me all the folders that have temp in it, because if it's named temp, I probably don't need it anymore. Now I'm going to take a look at deduplication. Deduplication removes redundant files or parts of files to save space on disk. The first way to do this is manually, by actually deleting one of the copies. And that can get pretty annoying to look through all the files, so luckily there's a lot of utilities that helps with this. In the Linux command line, one thing that can be used is fdupes. So I can get, say go recursive and start at the current directory and it's going to tell me all of these photos are the exact same file. If I want a GUI utility, this one here works in Windows and Linux and also has an optional CLI version and it can show me a lot of different types of duplicate files. So it can show me files that are exactly identical but it can also go show me things like files that are similar. So it looks at the photo and then looks at the second photo and sees if they're very similar. So if it's like re-encoded, it might show up as a very similar folder. It can also do this with video. So if you have like a 1080p and a 4K copy, you might want to remove your 1080p copy. There's a lot of different utilities that can do this. So here's a few web pages for other utilities that you can use. So if you want to remove your duplicate photos or videos by looking at the content, these can look at the content and find very similar ones. Often it's easier to have the system remove duplicate data automatically. So here's a few ways you can do that. Some file systems support having the duplicate data removed. A few examples is ZFS, NTFS in Windows Server, and BTRFS. But all of these come with a pretty heavy asterisk as there is disadvantages to doing so. NTFS has a bit of performance hit and you have to run an operation to go look at all the data. ZFS is known for having a very large RAM penalty and performance penalty for running dedupe. And BTRFS kind of has to run it afterwards like NTFS, and BTRFS is also just still a bit of an interesting file system. Compared to the hard links that I'm going to talk about in a second, the advantage of these methods is that they make no change to the operation of the files, and the user will not notice this at all. Another way you can save space of duplicates is by replacing duplicate files with hard links. So that means there's now two files that link to the same data on disk. So now these two files only takes the space of one file. But the disadvantage is, if you modify one of the files, the other files also modified. So make sure that's okay for your use case and that you won't be modifying these files if you don't want the other one changed. But if you're in Linux or other command lines, you can run rd find. I ran it with dry run first, so it's going to show me all the files that are replaced with hard links here. And then you can remove the dry run and actually run it and it'll save you a bit of space. In this case, I changed about 11 files and saved about 11 megabytes of data. Now I'm going to take a look at compression of a few different file types and show some programs that can be used to compress those files, go over a few different methods I use, and some of my strategies of when I would use compression versus when I wouldn't use compression. Compression can be put into two categories. Lossy compression, where some quality is lost compared to the original file, or lossless compression, where the original file can be extracted again by decompressing it. With lossy compression, you typically have a much larger file savings compared to quality loss. For example, this video you're watching now on YouTube likely is about 1 1,000th of the size of the original data that the sensor is outputting from the camera. But the quality is much more than 1 1,000th of the original quality, making it so that you're reducing file size much more than you're reducing quality. And for stuff like video where the raw sensor data is huge, 
being able to compress it in a lossy manner is almost necessary for things like online video. But for lots of things like text, you need lossless data compression. My other rule of thumb with compression is the more you know about the file, the more you can compress the file. So for example, with an image, you could just zip an uncompressed image and you will have a zip file that's smaller than the uncompressed image. But if you use a lossless file compression algorithm, so something like lossless JPEG, for example, you'll produce a smaller file size on average compared to using the zip compression. So try to use the most specific compression method you can. I'm going to first take a look at lossless file compression. These can work with any data and will losslessly make the data smaller. The problem is the data has to be compressible because the way these algorithms typically work is trying to take a look at repeated data and then try to remove that repetition. And in things that are already compressed, like most photos and videos, that won't help at all. So this typically only works with things like texts and maybe program and binary files that are compressible. So for example, in this here, I have a Linux system that I'm going to be using the 7-zip archiving program. So I have it set up to archive the file. Dash mx equals 9 means archive at the maximum amount. Almost all of these algorithms have a slider between how much CPU time they want to have versus the compression ratio. If you want the best possible compression, it needs a lot of CPU time. If you're willing to give up the compression ratio, you can do it with much less CPU time. And then I'm going to be making this SSD data.7 compression file and be giving it this folder of input data. And this is all logs that I've been making as part of one of my projects, so it compresses a lot. And this folder goes from about 30 megabytes to half a megabyte, because text like this can be very compressible. Another advantage is if I'm trying to archive files, it takes many thousands of files and turns it into one of file, which makes it so many file operations happen faster. If I want to do this on a Windows system with 7-zip installed, I can right click on it, go 7-zip, add to archive, and I will see a very similar menu options. So I'm going to see that same archive option, this normal ultra store thing. This does the exact same thing as the dash MX in the command prompt, and I'm going to make a compression algorithm here going to get a little thing, it's going to take a little bit of time, and I'm going to make this little 7-zip file that has all the exact data and I can extract to get all the exact same files out of it. But what if you don't want to make archives? Because making these archives takes time, and if I want to see the files, now I have to unarchive it, and that can get a little bit annoying. Some file systems support doing compression under the hood in a way that's invisible to the file system. For example, NTFS and Windows supports that. So in this folder, if I go right click and I go to properties, I can go to advanced and then I can go to compress contents to save disk space, click OK, and I'm going to get a little pop up when I click OK that says I want to make changes to all the files that are already there, and it's going to go and compress all of these files to make it smaller. So that way, if I go in this folder now and look at properties, I can see that I saved 25 megabytes. But this does have a cost. It uses a little bit of CPU time whenever I want to look at every file. Now I'm going to dive into some compression types for specific types of files. So let's first take a look at images. Images can often be quite large files as there's a lot of different pixels they have to show data of. And because of that, they're often shown in a lossy compressed matter. JPEG has been very common for a long period of time, but as technology has advanced, better compression algorithms have come out. One example of this is JPEG XL. It's a newer format that is still starting to gain traction, but it has some cool features I want to showcase here. Some other competing formats are like AVIF or HIF. All of these have similar features to JPEG, but offer better compression. So typically for a similar file size, these newer formats will have better looking images. But a few of the things I wanted to showcase in JPEG XL is its ability to recompress JPEG images losslessly. So I can actually take a lossy JPEG image and recompress it so that the recompressed image is about 15% smaller, but has the exact same image quality as the original JPEG, and can actually be turned back into the original JPEG if you want. JPEG XL has some command line utilities you can use here if you want to be able to script it, and the demonstration is right here. So I'm going to take this JPEG file and convert it into a JPEG XL file. And now that I've done the conversion, I can see that this file has gone from 103 megabytes to 85 megabytes. And then if I want, I can use the decompression method to turn my compressed method into an uncompressed .jpeg file. And then I can run the decompression method. It'll take a second or two, and it'll produce my decompressed image. And my decompressed image will be the exact same size and checksum as my original file. So in case JPEG XL isn't compatible, I can go decompress it. 
Sometimes though, images are uncompressed. In this case, I have a film scan that's 110 megabytes. And I want to try making it smaller using different methods to demonstrate my rule of thumb that more specific file compression algorithms work better. So the first thing I did is I just ran it through 7-zip and it went from 110 megabytes to 92 megabytes. Reasonable files save, but if I give it a more specific algorithm like PNG, I can get it down to about 85 megabytes and then JPEG Excel can turn it down to 70 megabytes. And all of these methods here are lossless, but looking at the more specific and the newer algorithms like JPEG Excel do significantly better than like PNG or 7-zip does. And just as a piece of reference, here's a lossy JPEG Excel image. And if I zoom in really closely, I can see the data that's lost here, but you probably won't even be able to see it on the screen because I have to get down to about 400% for it to be significantly visible as compression is very good at getting rid of very fine noise that humans aren't really great at seeing but takes lots of space on disk. And for many applications, being able to get the file to roughly 1 15th of its size and being very hard to notice often is a great savings of space with little quality loss. Another type of image file you may come across is raw files. These files can add up in space very quickly because they are designed to store the maximum amount of information that they can and not save space. But there still is a bit of ways you can save space. Especially if you have an uncompressed raw or an older lossless compressed raw using older algorithms, you can save a little bit of space using Adobe's DNG converter. This keeps the raw aspects of the image and allows for basically all the same conversion and is a lossless conversion if you set it to lossless mode, but can have a moderate file savings of maybe 10 to 20 percent. And it allows you to convert all the folders recursively in this It unfortunately though isn't perfect. If you're using some of the lossy raw formats on some cameras, you actually get bigger DNG files because you're converting from a lossy format to a lossless format. And sometimes you don't even get any benefit. So make sure you check with your files if it actually provides a benefit before going through. Now let's take a look at video files. Video files are almost always using lossy compression because lossless video is a massive file format and you want to be able to practically work with it on disks. But sometimes it can be worth it to compress from lossy video to a even more lossy video format to save file space. And when looking at that, I kind of take into account of how much file space it's currently taking and how large the file is and how efficient the current codec is. Recently, I've personally been using AV1 for these conversions because it seems to be one of the best codecs for having very low bitrate but still decent quality videos. I've been re-encoding videos like this into about 10 megabit videos. And because there's a lot of content in my videos that isn't changing very much, modern video codecs can get away with having like 10 megabit 4K and still preserving a lot of the quality and sharpness that makes the videos look good. And I don't really notice the difference unless I'm really looking for it. And here's some of the examples I use of how to do it. I've been using FFmpeg with SVT AV1 as my encoder. Preset 6 on a relatively fast system gets some fairly fast encoding for things like B-roll. I've been using Opus with a relatively low bitrate for audio. For things like talking, you don't need the highest possible bitrate to get great audio. Things like music and stuff can be a lot more affected by lower bit rates than talking, especially when I don't need the best quality. I have another script here that kind of renames videos and does it for my higher quality encodes. So I use a CRF of 8, which means a higher quality than 15, and I use a higher bit rate for audio as well. If you don't want to work with FFmpeg in the command line, Shutter Encoder is a great little program that does similar aspects. You can go in here and select many different codecs like AV1, you can select many different aspects like the bit rate, the audio, and all of those settings, edit and code it. And Shutter Encoder is using the same engine under the hood here. It just provides you with a nice GUI and makes it really easy to discover a lot of little features that you might want to turn on. Another format I'm going to take a look at briefly is PDFs. PDFs is a format with a lot of different types of media, and if you're working with a lot of PDFs, Adobe Acrobat while paid provides a lot of cool detail about what's using the space on the PDFs. But if you want to be able to script it, GhostScript has a little command line utility where you can take a PDF and modify it to make it smaller. And often this is done by compressing the images, as in a PDF with images, those can be the largest size by far. One example I have right here is I'm converting my 680i manual into a smaller PDF, and it goes from about 4.6 to 2.4 megabytes, which can really add up if you have a lot of PDFs. And then I'm changing it so that I'm using the screen output, which is about 300 dpi. 
it lowers the resolution and size of images, but in things like manuals, I don't need to have the perfect size, so I'm willing to sacrifice that for having a good amount of space savings. Another type of file is audio. Lossless audio codecs have gotten quite good, and FLAC seems to be one of the best ones. Shutter encoder is capable of doing FLAC conversions, along with FFmpeg in the command line. And a little example is I take this WAV file, which is uncompressed audio from a CD, and using FLAC can get it to roughly half the size with no quality loss. If I'm willing to use Opus to compress it a good amount more, which is one of the best lossy audio codecs, I can get it to about 10 megabytes or a tenth of the size, though with quality loss. If you're doing something like music where having quality is important, I'd stick with lossless if you have the original lossless source. But for things like audio, especially if you're listening on not great headphones, being able to squeeze it really small can be great. And that's just an example of four different media types that can be compressed relatively easy to have a significant file size savings with relatively little quality loss. Let me know if these methods were helpful for you to save file space on your system, or if you have any methods that you think would be helpful for others to know. Thanks for watching.